Yeah, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this is what you intend us to read about you, Lord God, and the rescue plan and the, um, the way that we must respond to that rescue plan, Lord. So we uh, thank you for it. Um, as Dan already said, uh, let all, all man's words fall to the floor tonight, Lord God, and let your word be lifted up in our hearts and minds and help us to be set free um, and informed about what has happened throughout the history of the church, Lord, and also uh, who you actually are and how, well, powerful you are. So, God, would you hand this over to you, Lord, and help us to really get our heads around this bit tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, we are going to turn to um, chapter 2 of Revelation. All right, we'll pause then a bit, eh? So anyway, we're going to continue, and um, so what we've been doing, we've been looking at the book of Revelation, something that people are really scared of even going near, and uh, because it's, you know, it's full of things that are mysterious and all that kind of thing, and Revelation means apocalypse, so that's the um, apocalypsis, which is the Greek word for the unveiling, so it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ to John, the apostle, as he was on Patmos, he was taken to the kind of place in the spirit, and um, he was able to be shown things, signs about things. So we're told in the first chapter that um, the structure of this whole book would be, write, therefore, what you have seen, number one, what is now, and what will take place later. So in the first chapter, we see Jesus risen and glorified, a description of him, what you have seen, um, then what is now, and what will take place later. Now, chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation describe seven different churches that really existed at the time. And John was supposed to give all of that information to all seven churches. All right? So this is, the, this is what's being written down and, and, and communicated in that case. Now, one of the, one of the things is, is, was it just, just intended for seven churches in Asia Minor, which is now Turkey? And the answer is, well, yes, it was, because he was told to give it to them seven churches. And it turns out that them seven churches have particular things about them that also map out the entire church age. You know, and, and that's something that people go, really? And one of the, one of the proofs is, is that um, we get um, a situation where Jesus says, after these things, then he was in the throne room of heaven and all these things kick off. But so what does that mean? Because if he, if he distributes the seven letters to, to the, these, this information to the seven churches, and he meant after you've distributed it and given them to the seven churches, then this will happen afterwards. And it didn't happen afterwards. So we have to put a chronological label on this and say he meant that this is the seven seasons of the church age. Now, we're at the end of this kind of now. We don't, we're very close to the end of it. But the amazing thing is, is when you look back on it, it actually maps out what actually happened in the history of the church. And tonight we're going to see it because this is the first of the churches that actually still remains on planet Earth. Okay? It's going to be heavy because it relies a lot on um, Old Testament material. I can't go into all of it because we'll probably be about four hours, but we're going to keep it down to three. No, I'm joking. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so I mean, we, we first saw Ephesus, which was the first century church, the darling church, Ephesus means the desired one. And there were people who, uh, we'll find out in Acts 20 that they met in homes, and when Paul was leaving them, they wept on him, and we commented on what sort of a love did they have one for another, that they'd weep on him. You know, what was all that about? And um, do we, and with the challenge, which is, I'm not going to do that tonight, but the challenge is, what are we about? What are we doing as Christians? Do we love one another? I think we do. But, I mean, what does that, does that become a deepening thing? And we're all, we're all, hopefully we're all pressing into the Lord and saying, you know, what, you know, what can we do with, the, with this group? Do we just want to be also ran churches? Have you heard that phrase? It's like, um, no one's ever heard that, but it's a legitimate British phrase. You've heard that, also ran. you never heard that. It's like average Oh, you, you yeah. explain that to us once. Yeah, you, when there's an horse race, you get one winner, but everybody else, they just they also run. Right. Do you know what I mean? Well, it's, they it, also run. Yeah, I did not ah. think that that's what you were saying. <laughs> so, the, so it's another way of saying, um, av it's just average. It's just you're just there to just be plod along, and you're not really. And Lord, you just want, Lord, you want to be that church that goes, you know, hey, Lord, we do want to be on board with you, and we want to love deeply, and we want to be in unity, and we want to do works that are inspired by you, not just good things, 
you know, so that you can be glorified, so that your will can be done on earth. Makes sense, doesn't it? So, I mean, so that's something what we talked about when we look at Ephesus. Their problem, their, their, the good thing that they did, what they, they tested false prophets and they did what Paul told them to do because he prophesied to them that savage wolves will come among you and destroy the flock and, and divide you. So they were very sensitive to that. Um, but what they did is they def- started to define spirituality by the things that you do. Okay? Spirituality is about positioning, positional, being positioned as a son under the Father. Get that? And Jesus makes that happen because we are reuni- reunited with our Father when we believe in the finished work of Jesus and, and Jesus, the Son of God. And the, um, and the other side of that coin is adoption. He adopts you as a child, okay? And that's the great celebration. That's why we sing songs and praise God because um, he's restored, he's turned back the curse. The curse was that we're all born into this world under Satan. We, uh, but when we get adopted by our father, we can... So when you talk to people and you say, oh, you're a child of God, and they're not a, not a Christian. No, they're not. They're a creation of God. But you, they can't be a child until they're adopted. That's why when you become a Christian... When you cross that line and say, that's what I want for my life, you are adopted by the Father. And then Romans 5 says he wants to, and Ephesians 1, he wants to lavish his love upon you. But sometimes he's got to give us a bit of a shake-up to get us into a place where he can. And we'll recognise it and we'll want more of it. That's a preamble. Smyrna was the second part of the church age. And we looked at um, the, um, the, that meant death, because myrrh, what was brought to the birth scene was, was the burial anointing, because they knew who he was, he was Messiah, he was born to die. Okay? And um, so the, the, words, the word Smyrna as the word myrrh, and when you get myrrh, you have to crush it for the aroma to come out. It's a perfume, it's a burial anointing perfume. And um, so that was the, the persecuted church, where th- millions and millions of people got killed by vicious emperors. There was ten main ones, and um, that was a real church age. There's archaeological evidence for it all, and all this kind of thing. And it's well written about outside of the Bible. Historians talk about that. Um, Josephus, if you're interested, Flavius jo- Josephus, um, he um, was. Um, so he's done a lot of writing on that kind of stuff. So you can. Mind, if you want to put a note and then just put a mind map on it to go and study that, I've got all the data of all Josephus' writings. I can pass it on to you. Okay. Um, then there was Pergamum. The devil tried to crush the church and kill the church, but people just went more and more towards Jesus. And then the devil's probably going, that's not what I wanted to happen. I wanted him to die before my very eyes. But actually it drove you to, to more kind of abandonment and yielding and submission before the precious Lord Jesus. So... Um, the tactics changed, and it was Pergamum, which means unequal marriage. So all these are real things that happened throughout history, and this um, unequal mar- marriage meant that the world and the church started to merge with one another. Just started it. They were courting, if you don't, if, if you'll pardon the expression. So basically, the church started to allow things that were not holy to happen in church. We did that uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then we had that wonderful Helen to come and visit us, and she told us about the church in the Congo. And we're all like, oh, my goodness. Sh- shut my sensibilities up for a while. And, um, you know, got me thinking about missions and all that kind of thing. So, um, but I do feel called to here. So, I mean, it's not like I've got to go to the Congo for a month or something, cause just because someone's at it. You know what I mean? That balance in it, you've got to know where you're called to be. Okay. Now, tonight, we're going to do Thyatira. If, if Ephesus was the desired one who um, who's... The wrong thing that they did was lost their first love. Smyrna was the persecuted church, and they didn't get any negatives because you don't kick a man while he's down. And if Pergamum, they uh, were very, they got uh, told that Jesus was going to come to them with his sword. Now, at Ephesus, he said, if you don't repent, I'll remove your lampstand, which is like the church. You'll, you'll still be gathering together, but I won't be there. What's the point in that? That's just a fraternity. Um, Smyrna didn't get any threat or any promise on the negative Pergamum did get a, um, a threat by Jesus I will bring my sword and fight with you in other, so in other words what, the word of God is supposed to be the thing that we live by in Pergam, Pergamum they stopped doing that and they started inviting worldly practices that have been well documented in there to not do and they started to do them by the time we get to Thyatira it was a full blown functional marriage between the world and the church in fact it became worldly so we're going to talk about that. If you want to know what period of time we call that, the medieval church, which the Roman Catholic Church was part of that, and we're going to explain why. 
the time. This is this is the King J James version from um, the, uh, the Thyatira Church, Revelation 2:18 onwards. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things say, saith the Son of God, who has eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works and the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, you, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which call herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as you have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put you none, none other burden. But you that are already all fast till I come. Look, I'm going to read this in English, proper English. Isn't it? And he that overcomes, keep my works to the end, to give him, I will give power. Is it over the nations? Because this is, I didn't print all of it for some strange reason. Yeah, power over the nations. Um, that one will rule with them with an iron sceptre. So, so, so can somebody read the whole of the NIV version because it's thought for thought and get this in Britain kind of. With a, I, I read this because it's the I will strike your kill your children with death and we're going to look at what that meant because that's kind of like what Jesus is going to come and kill children. Well, we'll find out what that actually means. So, yeah. Um, the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you, do, than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching, and have not learned to say some so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you, except to hold on to what you have until I come. Um, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter, and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So in, in chapter 1, we're told that this is all, we've got to hear and obey all this. So we've got to look at it and go, well, what's being said there? So we've got to try and pick out what's being said here. And some of it comes from the Old Testament, and I'll mention some things, but some of it will go off on another hour. You know, like, who is Jezebel? Well, we'll just go over a bit of that. Um, but it'll just give you the top line of what's being said. Uh, well, basically, Thyatira can be translated as continuing sacrifice. Now, I don't know whether you know this, but the Catholic Church, the... Um, well, first of all, Jesus, when it is one sacrifice that covers all, okay, his, his, his blood was shed once, and it means that it's, it's effective for every person who will ever be born into the world, including you, including me, all that kind of thing. But the Catholics re-enact the sacrifice every time, and they get the, the uh, bread and wine, and they think it actually turns into the body and blood of, of Jesus. It's called transubstantiation, and it's utterly ridiculous, all right, because we all know that doesn't happen. But the problem is, as well, they also believe that that's the sacrifice being made again, at mass, okay. So that fire tower can be translated continuing sacrifice is a little bit of a, you know, it's a little bit of a coincidence that that would be the, the, the one of the translations of the title. It used to be called um, Simiramis, the um, we was the mother of Nimrod, and Nimrod was the um, person who really, really, he was like an antichrist really, but um, and he founded Babylon, I think. So. I don't know, take your pick. Is it continuing th sacrifice or is it um, Simiranus, the mother of Nimrod, which has got everything to do with Babylon? Both, it used to be called that. So both are significant titles, whatever which way you want to translate. But it's not absolutely 
rock solid that we know that this is really, but it can be translated that way. Yeah. Pergamon was on its way to Thyatira, Thyatira, and um, and, and we'll see that, that the Lord steps up His judgment on the church, the medieval church. He was He's going to remove the lampstand at Ephesus. By the time we get to Pergamon, I'm going to come with a sword and fight with you. Okay. Then by this time we'll see that it's absolutely shocking what what is said. But just these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burning bronze. Anyone know what that's significant of? I know Blake does. <laughs> what is it, Blake? Um, the bronze or the, the eyes, because they're both significant. I found the eyes are probably later on the verse more significant than the bronze. But uh, so what was the bronze significant again? Judgment. It was two, though. Yeah, so, so his eyes are like fire. So basically... The, the, the symbolism is that when he looks at your life, or he looks at any life, or any, any, any church or anything like that, he burns away all that's of man and he actually knows what's going on. And in many churches he says, I know your deeds, and he says it later on here, I know your deeds. In other words, like you can't cover anything up before God. He knows, you know, like he's, he can see right into the very inner core motives of every person, every church, all that kind of thing. So that, that should leave you a little bit unnerved if you're a normal human being. To say Jesus, I, Jesus knows my deeds, and his, flame, his eyes are like flaming fire to see into the very core motives. And then my feet are like bronze. So in other words, I can see what's going on, and I can judge you. Well, I know dot it dot says dot. Brass. Brass I don't know. Copper and zinc, and I know bronze is copper and tin. There was a, there was a, um, it's some of the. I, didn't worry, don't want to go down the Old Testament route too much, but there's um, the laver was made out of bronze, and, and it's all significant about that. So when a Jew's reading this, he's going to, a Jew who's read the Old Testament and understands the culture of it all, he's going to simply go back to the temple and he's going to look at that, and it's all significant. You know, because don't forget the new covenants made with the Jews, we are grafted into the new covenant as, as Gentile believers, unless, of course, you're a Jew here tonight. So that's judgment. So, and it's interesting that here it's the only time he says I'm the son of God he usually says the son of man but he says the son of God and I wonder if that's significant because one of the main things in Thyatira or the Roman Catholic Church which became the Holy Roman See a political entity no church ever sent any military power to war it was a political party which sent people to the crusades so jesus didn't go oh yeah let's raise an army and kill muslims he didn't say that that was the holy roman sea which was a political entity um which this be- you know it became the holy roman sea um it's referenced in um in uh, micah i will give you hoops of bronze and break many uh pieces many nations break to pieces many nations <coughs> so it's similar sort of thing yeah so well, that's judgment, isn't it? When when yeah, nations are brought to pieces, it's strength. judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Strength, yeah. So the son, of, but he says the son of God, and it's amazing that what one other thing the Catholics did because, all right. And so when the Babil, Babylonians were idol worshippers, okay, and when they when they were in Babil, Babylon, which was Iran, sorry Iraq, okay. It was Iraq. It became Iraq, but it, that's the region where it was in. It was idol worship and everything. But when the Persians took over, the Book of Daniel, okay, they went to Pergamos, Pergamum, which is Pergamos. Pergamum's Greek, okay. So um, then they went to guess where they went next? The Babylonians. They went to Rome, okay, and that's where they. And we're going to find that these two things meet up in Rome, and that the the Holy Rome. Well, it's not Holy or Roman, but the the Catholic Church became. Um, I want to use the word bastardized in the right way. It became absolutely perverted towards idol worship. You see, we'll see this later on, and that's why. Um, well, uh, it's more brass translation in King James version. More correct rendering of bronze since yellow was tin, a uh, copper and tin. So it's, bro- it's bronze, not brass. Think, so it's just like a translation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So you get um. It's like we say, you get some um, translations, it's like butter and bread, but if you really want to study something, get a scalpel, do you know, so this is, we're just going thought for thought tonight, and if there's any Greek we need to do, we'll, we'll just dive into it. So he's called himself the Son of God, and I wonder if that's because Mary, 
was made into the deity, okay? Holy Holy Mary and Mary the, you know, the, I don't know, the divine. Well, she isn't divine. She says it herself when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Am I, what is it, something rejoiced in God my saviour? Yeah. So she knew she needed salvation. And if you need salvation, you certainly aren't God. All right, so... Well, so what happens is the, the, these, some of these things overlap. So Pergamum overlapped, and then as, as time went by, certain decisions were made, and it became. And really, what happened in Pergamum? It's a great question, that is. In the fourth century, Constantine. Right, so, so the church was um, persecuted by loads of emperors. Then along comes Co Constantine, who becomes a Christian, or says he does, right? And then Constantine um, merges the, um, the church that is on the earth right then and makes it in. The state and church merged together. So the, per the unequal marriage was state and church. It happened in the 4th century. So, um, so what happened is there wasn't a distinction between the, the people that God was setting apart as a holy remnant for himself and the people who were there. So you got things like people... Uh, clergy was To be in the clergy was a profession rather than a calling by God. So you could train to be a priest and then you'd go in front of a church and tell them all sorts of stuff. But that's not been called by God. That's you just learning the trade. You know what I mean? So there's a, so all that kind of thing. There's a load of list of things that happen. But re basically, um, it merged, and then that union became Thyatira, which was the Roman Catholic Church. The way we are trying to show throughout history that this has happened, and we'll see evidence from here that there's things in there which you will see in the Roman Catholic Church today. But if you don't know how it got to that place and, and where these things were introduced, then you'll just go, oh, they're just a bunch of people wearing frocks and worshipping Mary and all that kind of thing. But actually, it's very nefarious. It's actually from Babylon, some of the imagery, and it's um, idol worship and things like that. So, sorry if you're a fan of the Roman Catholic Church, but it's just... All right. Um, when you say idol worship, because of the sort of ornate statues and things like that that are in the church, yeah, I mean, worshipping Mary's idol worship yeah. because she's not a deity. Not, yeah. Not, yeah. So I wonder why he says, I'm the son of God. You know, can you wake yeah. up to this? Or he's been saying, I'm the son of man. Yeah. It's different this time. Yeah, and just to remind it's people. Trying to make a distinction, I think. Yeah. There is this worship. Well, you carry on. <laughs> There's this worship of the saints. No, yeah. Because, yeah, this, um, it's very common in Italy to worship, to pray, to. Uh, So where that comes from, just a sec, where that comes from is that in Pergamos, was the, remember when they used to get the, um, get the incense and when they were under Caesar, they'd sprinkle the incense in a flame and that was their pledge to Caesar. Now when Pergamos, he was first called God. Caesar was first called God. So when all this kind of became full blown in Thyatira, the emperor, you know, was considered to be a god. So whenever you get people who are significant to the Roman Catholic um, faith, there's no problem worshipping them because that's the from the Babylonians the way that that became a practice. Do you understand? Yeah. It's like so it's not a problem for somebody who's a, a Roman Catholic to go. Oh, you worship the saints because they worship Caesar. What's your problem? And you're going, what? <laughs> that's a big problem because it's idol worship. Because uh, um, I um, I actually went to a, a Catholic uh, youth group once and I talked to the actual. The actual, he was actually a priest at one of them. He doesn't. Uh, he's, he's a different sort of like we have like different denominations and stuff. He doesn't. He doesn't deal with the Pope. Like he doesn't think he's a all over all, all over all of them. So it's, it's a weird thing. Anyway, he was talking about basically the way they intercede for God as you go your ancestors and your stuff like that go to purgatory, not heaven. And from there, they you praise your to them. This is what he was telling me. It's very weird. And you praise your, your ancestors or your saints and stuff like that. And then they go and tell God. So you so you, you confess to your priest, and that and that priest then has a direct line to God and will tell God your sins. And then for prayers and stuff, you praise your ancestors and your saints. And he then and they go and talk to God. So you can actually have a physical like, relationship in their religion 
to talk to God. You're always going through a second party. So they're saying it's very important because if you come out of faith with them, then they will be like, oh, well, I'm not talking to God for you. So it's because of the priest and the relatives. Yeah, and the, and the people that have died before. I think that's the purgatory. It's very, very weird. Okay, just quickly, you can turn to this if you want, but First Timothy, um, chapter 2. So this is what says, um, 3, 2, 3. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and how many mediators between God and men? One. one. The man Christ Jesus, okay? Who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. So whenever anyone says to you, it's all right to have a man or any kind of deity or any historical figure that you look up to and go, wow, right? And you give disproportionate leverage to, you know what I mean, to run your life is wrong. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and he's perfectly able to deal with all the stuff that we throw at him, you know, even abuse, you know, because he loves people. So, um, but I'd rather probably don't abuse him. So, um, <coughs> yeah, as you'll find out later on in this lesson. So. <laughs> These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burning bronze. Judgment, I can see it, right? I know your deeds, your love and faith. Now, he's talking to some people who he later addresses who were in this church age, but they're not practicing, practicing it, but they are approving of it and not challenging it. Right. See the difference? That's really important that we get this. So, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance and that you have now doing more than you did at first so he's talking to a set of people there's always been the remnant throughout the church age no matter how bad the church gets and how it gets manified if that's the right word um, and the flesh takes over and all that kind of thing there's always a remnant God keeps aside and um, we'll find out that the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church were always good at killing that remnant okay identifying them then killing them so we'll talk about that probably more next week but they did it as well um, you're doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. So tolerating is not the same as buying into it. And it, later on we'll find that some people, who, they, they're buying into this doctrine and that's where God is really triggered. Okay, it's just not to question or to ask, ask about it, just use it, accept it, but you don't deal with it. And this is where we get into like Titus and Jude. Are you alright everyone? Titus and Jude, where you, we're instructed to, if somebody's got a heresy, which is false teaching, you've got to, you know, no. And, and people people say to me, I've got a red, amber and green thing. There's all these tele-evangelists, and they're in red, some of them, because they take false teaching, and I've got no, no time for it. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's sowing into the world a wrong message about Jesus. You know, so, anyway, we're, we're told to do that in Jude and Titus and other places, so I don't see why. Anyway, nevertheless, I have this against you, told out that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess by her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols whenever you see sexual immora immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols it's a colloquialism for idol worship okay because you you're gonna you're gonna i mean apart from the fact that they actually ate the bread and the wine and they thought it was jesus flesh and all that kind of and his blood um that's a bit weird um, and then Mary was the one that, you know, you can clearly see idol worship, which, cat which comes down to eating and drinking and sexual immorality. Because anyone who's not attached to Jesus and you're having a walk with Jesus and you're sourcing yourself in Jesus, eventually you'll find yourself find coming to a base level of humanity that runs off sensuality. And uh, we, we just do what we want, basically. And, um, without any restraint, but the whole point of being a Christian is, God, I'm, I'm in trouble, I, I'm like, if I, if I don't walk with God, then I'm just kind of like, sensual and indulgent, and everything goes off into a tangent over there, you know what I mean, so, it's always, imp if you're worshipping an idol, then you're not connected to Jesus, and you're going to just fall back on those base instincts, which God doesn't say are wrong, he put, we made us feeling and sensual people, who enjoy stuff, alright, so he's not going, oh, don't have a good time, you know, with your married partner. You know, he's, he's saying, no, knock yourself out, but don't let that rule your life. It's like money. It's good. To, it's all right to have money as long as money's not got you. And it's all right to have, you know, a wholesome relationship with your married partner, and really enjoy that kind of thing as long as it's not going off into some kind of unrestrained, unholy kind of thing. Do you see what I mean? It's balance and it's giving thanks for everything and doing it in Jesus' name. Do you know what I mean? So he's given us all the good things that we enjoy, but then there's the, the time when that all edges towards 
that's not great. Control. It's out of control, and we get it's not really doing it anyway. So, so they're tolerating Je Jezebel, okay, who calls herself a prophetess. Now Jezebel was um, she was married to King Ahab, and they led Israel, okay, and uh, they they introduced Baal worship, okay. So they that what that is Baal means husband, okay. So when you look at the book of Hosea, you find out that uh, Hosea had to marry a prostitute. And the old object lesson was to show how Israel is in relationship to their God. They're going off with prostitutes and the, the, the worshipping false idols. And this is how God has expressed himself through the ages. Girls, you get called a son of God. Capital S because it's encapsulating daughter as well. But don't forget, guys, you get called a bride. All right, so it's like there's a little bit of things that you have to do with that. But we are a bride and God, you know, the all kind of imagery of, of a marriage. You, Jesus is the bride groom and the church is the bride. It's, it's, a, it's a mystery, right? It's, but that's what it is. And there's a marriage in heaven later. And then there's a wedding feast of the Lamb when Jesus comes back and all that kind of thing. So there's all this mystery about, you know, um, marriage is, is massive in the, in the thing. Because it's covenanting, isn't it? So, and becoming a Christian is a covenant. You make a covenant to God, and you say, "God, I want to. This is awesome. I want Jesus to be part of my life. I want to. I want to. Um, I, I take responsibility for the, for my sin and the fact that I've broken your law. And I want you that sacrifice that you made to be true of my life. And I want to walk with God and be re reunited as a son with God. And that's what becoming a Christian is. And, and then from that day, you just walk with God, and and the, the brothers and sisters around you will support you. And, you know, you get you can support others as well, and and it's just great because you can hopefully, you know, get to walk well with Jesus. I don't even know why I mentioned that. Oh yeah, because Jezebel, right? Um, she uh, they, they were Baal worship, and they openly chose idols to be their partner to partner with them, and they also kept God there as well. So there was all false teaching in there, and this is in the Old Testament in Israel. But then when Elijah came along, he was the one with the message was, how long are you going to sit on the fence? You're neither on the idol side or the, the Yahweh side. Yahweh means God. Okay, The um, Hebrew letters, yod he vav he if you put the vowels in, it's Yahweh. All right, so, um, so that's what she did. They killed, she killed the prophets. And what, what happened, we know that the, the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, worshipped false idols. What many people don't know is that they killed the righteous people of God, they went after them with the sword and murdered them. And, and they were people who said, oh, we don't want anything to do with that. And these are the people that God is addressing. You who live in this season of Thyatira, you, you're still tolerating it. You know, you're not doing anything about it. But when they did do something about it, they got killed. You know, so I mean, I don't know. But the Lord's got an issue with that, right? Yeah, and, and if you didn't, so they still say it today, if you're, not a, if you're not a member of the Roman Catholic Church, you ain't going to heaven. Mm. And the Pope says that, he says it in 2017, you're there going, look, will someone talk to that guy and just tell him that there's billion, millions of um, Christians out there, nothing to do with the Catholic Church, and just go in, you know, and we'll talk about that next week and onwards, because next week is, is the, um, the fruit of the, the Great Reformation, when the protesters, the Protestants, because they protested against the Roman Catholic Church, split from that, and then it was all good for a while, but then it went really not good, and we'll talk about that next week as well. So, um, and we've, we can see the Roman Catholic Church on earth today, we can see the Protestant denominational church on earth, we can see Philadelphia, which is the, the remnant to, to pull aside, interesting, and then we'll see, we see the Laodicean church, which define spirituality by wealth, personal wealth, that's the blab it and grab it preachers, um, and the Mercedes, if you haven't got Mercedes, then you ain't as blessed as me, you know, and it's all ridiculous. Like that, so. Um, so Jezebel, yes, so they murdered God's peoples, and she killed the prophets. Um, control, so what the, um, she was a control thing, uh, Jezebel, and um, what the, the Roman Catholic Church did um, to these people who are in purgatory, like, you know, when you said about purgatory, that's a, that's a Roman Catholic doctrine, yeah. the people going to purgatory, they went to the peasants and said, well, if, we, if you give us money, we'll pray your relative out of purgatory. Mm. And they, they built the Sistine Chapel from peasants' money, right, to glorify themselves. And that makes my blood boil. And it made God's blood boil. Watch what happens, okay? Um, so false ruling. Balaam was uh, indicted in all this kind of stuff as well. Um, 
the, the just false rule, and it's all to do with the, the Roman Catholic Church, worshipping idols, murdering God's people, mani manipulated deals. And have you ever heard of um, Niboth's Vineyard? Anyway, so there was a deal, and he wanted want to buy some land, and in Israel you can't buy land. You can rent it out, but you can't take it from the original owner, so they had him killed. Long story, can't get into that tonight, but that's the kind of thing that they did, and it's a little bit to like... To get all the land. To get all the land, yeah. Um, so, there's a lot of crossover. So when Jesus says something like, that woman Jezebel, it's a loaded statement. You have to know about Jezebel and go back and do some study, and it's a great study because you find out... She gets um, she gets killed in the end. It's kind of gruesome how the way she gets killed and some of the details around there. But it actually happened, and Elijah was the one who um, was part of that kind of whole thing. So. Um, she wasn't exactly a nice person. So. Oh, the, she wasn't the worst. They weren't the worst rulers in Israel, but they were probably yeah. second worst. They were terrible, and it, um, it all went very very bad from. Um, anyway, so let's move on, because this is like we're now 35 minutes in. You don't want it to go over three hours. I'm um, so, um, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, calls herself a prophetess. Never seen that today, have we? People calling herself a prophet and making a prophet. Okay. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual morality of eating food sacrificed to idols, idol worship. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, at least the Western wing, went for a thousand years okay around about 500 ish probably a bit before that and about 16 1600 when the great uh, reformation things started to change it's actually a couple of hundred years before that the printing presses started to be made in anticipation for the writings of martin luther zwingli all the people who were the reformers in europe who turned around to the catholic church and went no. we're going to listen to this not the man in address in rome okay we're going to do that and um and that's where Martin Luther was like sola scriptura by scripture alone, you know, by faith in, in things. You, these are the scriptures given to every person, and your responsibility is to look at them and go, you know what? God's leading me through that. He's showing me stories about my life. He's showing me the things where I shortfall, and then he tells that. Then then people go to God, and God forgives them. It's happening to you. It happens to me, and we can always go to God for forgiveness because of the way He's put repentance into the Christian walk. Repentance is a, it's actually a Roman Catholic word, and it's for penitence, and it's repentance. We, we can't get away from the legacy of Rome. It's in our language, it's in what we do, it's in the things that we um, practice, and a lot of the Protestant churches still have a man at the front who controls everything. He's a mini-pope. Tithing comes from Roman Catholic as well, because yeah. it was the tax system, the state that did uh, income from the tax, and because it was the church and state, then they continued on in the, in the, in the Reformation as, as a tithe. Yeah, and also the, 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 the fact that the priest stays unmarried was brought in around about, I'm not going to go exactly on the date, around about 12, 1300, because um, they owned that properties. And if they were a priest and they married, the property would go to the woman. So the Roman Catholic Church brought in a rule that don't get married, you're not allowed to get married. So when they die, the property goes to the Roman Catholic Church, and that's the only reason why they did it. And then it sets the priest up for an unnatural life, exactly. and then he goes and drives himself mad and then you get all this abuse that occurs so anyway not everyone in the Roman Catholic Church is very bad it's not we're not you know slagging them off or giving them an hard time for no reason we're just telling you what's written here and why it probably lines up with that period of history and it's still on the earth today I've given her time to repent a thousand years and her uh, immoral immorality but she's unwilling so I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. So there's going to be... Does anyone get any other um, translation for a bed of suffering? Uh, India will cast her into a sick bed. Sick bed? Anything else? Cast her into a bed. Mm -hmm. uh, them that commit adultery with her on, into a great tribulation. So what can be read with the Greek there is, look, I am throwing her into a coffin. That's what can be rendered from the text, from the actual Greek text. So it's interesting for what comes next. Okay. Um, so, so those who commit adultery with her. So what we've got, we've got a bunch of people who know it's happening and they're not addressing it. And God's got an issue with that. He's like, I want you to be aware that you, you, we've got to push back. Jude, contend for the faith. Don't let people just go off and 
you know, I wouldn't get into big squabbles and stuff. To warn someone twice, it says in Titus, then walk away. Okay. So just as a thing, whenever you're trying to challenge somebody, warn them twice and walk away. That's the scriptural command. That's all you got to do. And if they won't repent, then it's out of your hands. Okay. If you're originally burdened with it, you go, you know what? That's I can't actually sit here without addressing that, and that happens to me quite a lot. So I'll address something, and I'll only do it twice through scripture. So don't keep like a dog with a bone because that's unfruitful. You're only told to do it twice. Happy? Okay. Um, I'll cast her on a bed of suffering and I'll throw you into a coffin that can be rendered and I will make those who commit adultery with her. So basically, when com committing adultery with Jezebel is fully getting on board and approving everything that's going on with that thing, you know? So you get a lot of people who dive in, they don't question it and they just hook, line and sinker. They're actually covenanting with it because that's what it committing adultery, you know? It's a covenanting with that whole thing. I'm, I'm actually, I've, I've um, spoken to people in the Roman Catholic Church, and I don't, I can't speak the same language. It's just, it's just within a couple of minutes, you're just on widely, widely different paths. And what? You, what it doesn't mean that, you know? And it, and that doesn't mean that, and it's all mess, messed up, the whole thing. Unless you, um, uh, I commit, uh, uh, where am I? I will make those who suffer uh, commit. Adultery with her suffer intensely. Let me just see what I've got here because it's that's in. Also, it's it's the great tribulation. All right, this can be rendered that this church will go into the great tribulation. The Roman Catholic Church, the people who are involved in that and who have who have covenanted with it, will not be, be taken and snatched away. Okay, so there's your reference for that. Um, anyone got anything to jump in? Because this starts getting a bit heavy right now. I will strike her children dead. Now, what you need to know is that in the well, 1340 to 1400, there was the bubonic plague. And um, that was through Europe and it went to Africa. It's been in China as well. And that was the single most biggest slaughter of humankind of all things. Do you know how many people died in the bubonic plague? Was that 2 million? 50 million. 50 million people died. Right? And a lot of people think that because that's the height and the, the, uh, the biggest divide between clergy, which are the paid people who do this, and the laity, which is the people, that divide there was most then the biggest problems were going on there. And he's given, I've given you time. I told you I'll strike your children dead and 50 million people were wiped off the face of the earth by being thrown into coffins. They had to throw them in, get rid of them, oh, lead coffins. Graves. Yeah, they were just yeah. chucked into graves. Uh, they say a lot of that... Um, could have been stemmed if the uh, the wealth was spread around a lot more because of the church was so wealthy and they mm -hmm. had pretty yeah. much it was pretty much like America now like ninety five percent of the wealth the actual disease could have been prevented more and, and helped more if, it, if it, the wealth was distributed a lot more fairly mm -hmm. um, yeah because a lot of clean it was rats mm -hmm. clean food clean water all that sort of stuff and that was what spread a lot of the disease. It was the flea on the rat, wasn't it? it was yeah. Which was the problem. Yeah. And um, and the, the thing, the other thing about this all, this is like the, when you look at God's word, it's Bacteria. it's poetic and it's got loaded with meaning because the bubonic plague was um, was something that appeared in the groin area and it was um, like uh, armpits, armpits right. and everything, yeah. But it's just significant Legs. because one of the I think one of the bubonic or thing means the groin or something like that. So that was like the lymph nodes and everything. Like that. I don't know much about it, I've just read some stuff up in it. But I, I do know that the, the nursery rhyme, Ring a Ring a Roses, a pocket yeah, full of poses, yeah. a tissue a tissue, we all fall. Down like God, Yeah, it is about the bubonic plague. Yeah. So when all the kids are going, teach kids that, Ring a Ring a <laughs> they're actually talking about 50 million people being wiped off yeah. the earth through the, possibly through the actions of God's judgment on earth. You know what I mean? So. I was trying to be conservative so it wasn't so shocking, but it was it was just like just yeah. unbelievable. They they exactly. yeah. Sadly, mm. <laughs> my dad was on the M62 motorway construction, and he um, he they were digging stuff up and everything. He dug up these lead coffins, right? So it happens a lot apparently in England, and um, and the lead coffins when they opened them, there was because nothing was allowed out of a lead coffin, and it was it was full of liquid and like bones and hair with still hair on the head and he said it was like God. He told me this, I was about seven when he told me. I'm like lying in bed at night for about four years going, <laughs> you know, just 
why don't you just put more scary thoughts into my head? You know? so, so yeah, and the, all these coffins came flying out, and it was like so they had to throw people into lead coffins, and I don't even think everyone got that treatment, but certainly we've got to contain this thing, you know. And I, I visited someone called is it? Did you ever come? Ian, Ian was it in? I can't even remember where it is in Britain now. But um, you go there, and it's like they, they preserved the houses where it was, and and people just it wiped the whole villages out. There was no one living there. Mm-hmm. Everyone's dead. You know, so anyway, let's balance this out a little bit because Jesus says what he's, he he means what he says and he says what he means, right? And, and I'm not saying, and other people argue, they say, oh, that's not the bubonic plague. Jesus wouldn't do that. I'll throw you into a bed of suffering. I'll strike your children dead. And then at the right at the height of the Roman Catholic abuses and the, the things that they were doing, you know, I think Jesus came to judge that part of the world. And, um, and that's what happened. And... Well, now we look back on it, don't you think it's fascinating that that was right at the very beginning of the church age? If you don't repent, I'll strike your children dead. You didn't, re- and it says you there, and you, you didn't, she didn't repent before the time he prophesied. You won't repent, so he did that, and then that happened. So there's a coming judgment, okay, which he talks about. So make sure you're on the ark, Noah's ark, because judgment's coming. Make sure you are in the, you know the Lord's hands when that judgment comes because this next one is going to be much, much, much worse because he's going to come back to earth and he's going to, he's furious he doesn't come back as gentle Jesus, meek and mild the loving shepherd, which now in this room extends his hand for you to come to him and walk with him for the rest of your life but he comes as the lion and he's furious, he comes in fury and he says he'll rule the earth the entire earth with a rod of iron not for the believers because you've all I don't know I'm not, I don't want a rod of iron, you know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus, I want to follow you. I'll, I'll be my shepherd now, and, um, and I'll be a member of your sheep. I and mean, sheep are always dumb, so he's all right if you get it wrong. But, you know, <laughs> do you know so I, I want to be a dumb sheep. And, so, and I want you to excavate me now. I want you to conquer me now, rather than wait until you come back furious with me because I didn't take the escape plan. And furious with me because I knew what the gospel meant. I knew there's a way out. You give me every chance to repent and turn to you and follow you. Yet I just did what I want. You know what I mean? Then he comes back and said, you know, I died on a cross. You know, I I did everything. I took the hit for mankind. And you didn't respond to that. So, well, I'll leave that one with you. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches, all the churches here, and if this is about all the churches of history, will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now, when it says according to your deeds, it doesn't mean that he's going, oh, baseball bat in his hand, going like, oh, you're getting it wrong. Like, the, the, your deeds is, what did you do with Jesus? If you reject Jesus and go around rejecting him, right, and you've made a decision, oh, I don't want to follow Jesus, then your deeds are deeds of unrighteousness by default, okay? If you accept Jesus and you walk with him and you confess your sin to him and he forgives you and you just become a Christian, then all you start your journey of the deeds of righteousness. So a Christian is not ever going to be condemned by Jesus. Now, he'll come and he'll do something called flipsis, which is the, um, which is the Greek word for the child training, the thing that he comes. And he'll take you through stuff, and we talk about that a lot in this because we've been through it and we walk this out. And he'll, um, he'll bring stuff into your life to excavate you. And it's called sanctification. He's trying to make you better at walking with Jesus. We're not talking about that. We're talking about when he comes. What's that, Blake? With this one, just for the... He, I am he who searches the reins and the hearts. Yeah. What is... All right, so... Yeah, it's, hearts and minds, but what is... So the, the, your inner reins are the... Are the, 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 the I mean, Job says it, when I think it's chapter 19, when he says... Um, um, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I'll stand on the earth, and although my, the reins within me will be gone, I will I'll stand on the earth and see my Lord. He knew that there will be a resurrection, and he knew that Jesus will come back. Don't you find that amazing? But the reins within me will be gone. So it's like the innermost parts. Everyone knows they've got stuff in there, which is like, they call them the reins within me. You know, the tendons and the things like that. So, so I'm more confused than when I started. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I don't know what that means. Yeah, your body. That's what it means. And inside that body, mysteriously, God lives. But he's inside your spirit. So they, they wouldn't go, oh, we are body, soul and spirit, and start to articulate it like that. They're just going, this, this body is, contains God, and it's going to rot away. So when that, you know, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a, that kind of thing. You're reading King James, aren't you? 
Yeah, I suppose the Baby. eyes on uh, uh, the eyes flaming eyes is also helps with that. So it's mm. searching for um, uh, reins and hearts of people. His eyes are like fire, so he burns away all the untruth. Yep. So, carry, happy to carry on? I am he who searches the hearts and minds and will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, in other words, not them who have committed adultery with Jezebel and they're all just walking with it, you know, and all that kind of thing. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned the certain so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden of you. So what these certain so-called deep secrets are, right, to the one who sees everything... Right, is the uh, Babylonian practices of the Roman Catholic Church and there's all kinds of things going on. I wouldn't trust YouTube to give you accurate stuff but there is some good stuff out there which says what are the Roman Catholic Church actually up to? And um, well, you can waste an hour getting shocked to the core about what's actually going on. And um, just to, as a side issue while I'm saying that this is not about all the people who call themselves Roman Catholics because how can you possibly just lump them all? Because it says here some people are alright and they're not doing that stuff um, I'd say to them come out of it then what are you in it for but, I mean, that's just my opinion um, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira to you all do not hold to a teaching have not learned the deep certain so called deep secrets I will not impose any other burden on you only to hold on to what you have until I come so when he says hold on to what you have until I come it means it ain't coming. he ain't coming yet I, I just read that into it because in Sardis he also says um, where are we? I will come to you. Uh, yeah. Um, if you didn't wake up, I will come like a thief. Yeah, I will come like a thief in that, which is definitely the harpazo. And you will not know, but he's not saying, I'm coming soon. Philadelphia, he says, I'm coming soon. And then in Laodicea, he says, um, here I am. Mm. Um, right, now, that's something, I'd look that up, right? And um, the, the Jews use the word hineni for that, here I am. And that means here, here I am in Greek, right? But the word in, in Greek is idu, which is hard to translate because it means something out of the ordinary is going to happen. Behold. Okay, so you've got look, listen, and behold in your Bibles there. But the Jews put hineni because they're like, that's what it actually means, here I am. And um, so you do, you do the math. I mean, I've not heard anyone say this before, but it's clearly before you. Four churches are on the earth right now. Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea and in Laodicea that we can see is on the earth now Jesus says here I am do the math okay? um, with my one it says um, hold fast oh, you have already uh, sorry alright uh, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, okay, I will give authority over the nations. Right. So um, this is the big deal. Right. Whose will do you want to do? Do you want to do the will of a church denomination? Do you want to do the church of uh, a, a stream, a popular stream of churches? Do you want to do a, the, the biggest, um, fanciest looking church in the world? The, the, the one that's got more people in it than the other one? Do you want to do that will? Or do you want to do the will of Jesus? Okay, and that's something that I'll leave with you to decide because um, you know we had, we came away from some of this stuff. What what isn't great to try and do what we're doing here. So we meet in a home like the first Christians did, and we meet with um, trying to do what they did as well and eat food together like a family, and to because we're all brothers and sisters under one father. So we're trying to do that, and that's why we're not doing the other things because there's so many dangerous pitfalls and things to trip over and all that kind of thing. But be warned. Because we are all vulnerable and all these things can happen to us. So how would Jezebel look in this situation? How would a Jezebel kind of character, how would that work out, do you think? It's a bit of a, throw you a difficult question. If we would kept doing what we're doing, what would the Jezebel thing look like if that rose, yeah, rose up amongst us? Yeah, how would that look? Who takes control of the group? I'm yeah. the one who can, like, yeah. I'm the one who's got all the answers. You know, we could start We've got a couple of vases. We could start going. Come on, hmm. pop up. Hmm. Uh, start getting <laughs> I think she was you know, going to help and try and help us pay for mouse traps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mouse church. <laughs> like beco
um, a group rather than a family. So mm. like something that's um, something you have to attend, something that is you know strict, and you know if you don't come, then you know you're gonna be you know in hell. So hierarchy and yeah, all that stuff, right. and wrong. You know, all the things that we looked at here, worshiping idols instead of worshiping Jesus, right? We could worship a ministry gift. We could we could worship people. We could worship. We could even go look at us. We do house church, like the scriptures say, and that's wrong because we are as vulnerable to all these pitfalls as anything else. So we just got to keep our radar on for um, discernment and just to know that um, we are vulnerable, um, but also Jesus is good. And we'll see when it gets to Philadelphia. That this you stay humble and not, yeah. not get that pride and all sorts of things. Yeah. Well. And saying to God, you know, keep 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 us humble. You know, we want to we don't want to trip up on this. And we I can't wait to get to Philadelphia. That'll be a great week because it's um it's got some really good stuff in it. So and control and and ruling people are ruling others. It's all ridiculous and it's all come out of history. And um, I think it, her character as well and the way that she handled obviously the vineyard and stuff is very underhanded as well. So it wasn't, obviously she, she had the power to do that sort of stuff, but it wasn't exactly like directly out there. It was very, not slow, but under 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 the radar sort of thing. So she'd be very conniving, and, or he or whoever would be conniving and political per se. Hmm. The personality was very much about sexual immorality. That was her symbol. Yeah. That's right. so, yeah. yeah. So things to take away from it is that the church can be infected by idol worship and Babylon it can get, it can get into it and it's very seductive and it can you know because because imagine right if you get involved with something and this happens all the time and you're a leader in it and then you know you start to get recognition for all that and, and money right we'll talk about money in a second because the Bible doesn't say don't give it says the way you give is important so um, yeah and all that starts to now become a value system for me or you, whoever rises up and goes, you know, you know so, then that's dangerous because um, that's when people start to come out of, you know, the, um, the submission and yielding between, under Jesus and they start to go, hold on a minute, I've got latitude here, I can affect things and it feels good to me, attention, adoration, applause, that's the holy trinity, what everybody wants in the heart, isn't it, the kind of attention, applause, not everyone, well, is it just me, but you know, when you... <laughs> All that kind of thing. And that's what ministry brings, so we're trying to get away from that and do it all differently. So we're accountable to each other. So if, if you see something um, which you think, oh, that's a bit weird, and it happens to me, people say, what, what did you actually mean by that? And then I'll have to sort of like unpack some stuff. Um, and simply because I do this. You know. um, and that's right to do that. It's right to be accountable to one another. Yeah. And that's why we have dialogue rather than monologue. So that people can go, is that right? Is that actually what's going on? And here, that's how I told you before, I don't think I've said it this week, but we're presenting a model of what the, we're not saying this is what you must believe. We're just saying, isn't it interesting that this actually looks like that medieval church, which did this and then the bubonic plague, and it was said very clearly, throw you into a bed of suffering, and you know, if you don't repent. So, um, so that happened, and it still happens today. The Roman Catholic Church, the medieval church. Um, is still on the earth, and um, we just th- this is interesting, right? So, if you to him overcome, oh no, wait, um, to him overcomes and does my will to the end, to the end, okay, I will give authority over the nations. Does anyone know what that means? I w- he will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Does anyone know what that's referring to? Well, it's the millennial reign, isn't it? When he gives you authority over the nations. You know, so there it is in black and white. It's going to happen. It's you know, there's a there's a return of Christ. He will, um, you know, rule on earth for a thousand years, and because um, that's the Davidic covenant. It's not just like, oh, what should we do that for God? Oh, well, a thousand years. You know, making it up. You know, it's just like that's um, the Davidic covenant outworked on earth. So what happens to believers? They are given tasks and roles and functions to rule over nations. And he will rule them, the n- them nations, with an iron scepter, and he will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I also give him the morning star. That's just another, because it's funny, right? Because this will throw you into a bit of a tiz, because the devil's called the morning star. Oh, morning star, son of the dawn, how you have fallen from heaven. Okay? But it's just a description of the, the, the um, light bearer. Okay? 
So it's not like the morning star is a name for Jesus and saying it's just that the morning star is the light bearer. So you might not know this, but Lucifer means light bearer. Okay, and then he's. Um, was it? Yeah. So the, the, it's like a honourable thing. So we just got to make sure we're not putting labels on things where we where they don't. Think. Last verse now. Um, he also he who also has an ear. Let him, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here is what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Has it never occurred to you before? The Holy the Spirit is saying this to the churches. He's saying it to this church, and he's saying it to all churches of all time. So that is Thyatira. Now, there's a few things what we need to do. It's gone over an hour now. So um, do a study on Jezebel. Find out what that's about. And some people say she's got a Jezebel spirit, right? And it's not just she. It's everybody can have that Jezebel control. It's ridiculous to just go. And people band it around and make people feel bad. And, you know, especially people who just want to help. Don't be so Jezebel, you know, you're like, oh, come on. So Jezebel's much worse than the thing. But but there is it is in the church today, and you get people who shouldn't be controlling, they shouldn't be idol worshipping, and they shouldn't be. Um, today, I don't think we kill the prophets. I don't think people get martyred in our Western context. But you certainly get socially martyred. And churches are good at socially martyring people, cutting people off and going, and then, then reforming and grouping up. And then you're on the outside. I've had it happen to me. It's horrible. You know, especially when you're naive enough to think that brothers and sisters love one another, like I am naive to, enough to think that still, you know, because I won't ever let go of that. We can love one another. We can treat each other like family. We can be good at this. Right, let's just turn to Revelation, right at the very last verses, and we'll finish this. What the? Oh. Revelation 22:17. This is fantastic, right? So, who's the spirit? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Who's the bride? Uh, right. So, watch this. The spirit and the bride say, "Come," and let him who hears say, "Come." Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Don't you think that is just fantastic? All right, that's Jesus saying that. The Spirit and the Bride. So in other words, this is the time where the Holy Spirit would fill the church, you know, and offer salvation to everybody and say, come, come to the water, come to the living, uh, the water of life, freely given. So, so tonight, okay, I'll say it to everybody, you Christians who've been sailing this ship a while, you know, you can still come to the water of life, you know, and just take a drink. And if you're thirsty, spirit, this is spiritual stuff, you know. If you're thirsty, then he'll, he'll give you a drink, you know, and he'll help you do it. And it's usually the water of his word and, you know, to, to drink that water and everything. Because life refreshes all yep. the lakes and all. Yeah. And, and it's, it, water's refreshing and it quenches the thirst. And the thirst is there because those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. So the, it's, a, it's a mechanism of God to draw you to himself. So if you feel thirsty for God and you feel like, I can't, just can't get enough of God, and that's thirsty. It's like, when I get thirsty, I'm like, I just need water. You know, you've got to drink. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be great if you go a long period of time without drinking. Same with Jesus, right? Don't neglect your walk. Don't let it walk, fall by the wayside um, and let all these things encroach upon it so that you've got hardly any wriggle room to, to get to Jesus. Just put them aside. Go to Jesus and um, and he'll give you a drink. If, if you've never done that before, if it's something that you're thinking, what's all this giving a drink thing and the free gift of water of life, in your own time, Jesus is saying, and we know he's saying it because he's saying it here, and he's saying it through the Spirit, through the church. He's saying, come, come to me and I'll give you that free water of life and you'll never thirst again to the point where you'll be in, in distress because you can keep going to Jesus for the water. Okay, so... Um, there you go. Thyatira, any questions? I've got loads of questions about that because there's so much you don't like we didn't talk about. But um any comments, questions? Is the Anglican Church very close to the Roman Catholic Church and, sure. and, and so it's sort of like um, 
So what happened, we, this thing which we'll talk about next week, which was the Reformation. So people got sick of indulgences and idol worship and the clergy and laity. They wouldn't teach the peasants and you know the people, really, to read. Because if they taught them to read, they'd read the Bible and then go, oh, hold on a minute, this is talking to me. You know, so they told them and interpreted it for them. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of things going on in that. But after the Reformation, you got the um, people who went, we are protesting against that Catholic Church. There you got the Protestants. The Protestants. And then um, the Anglican Church was part of the Protestant movement. But there was also a spectrum of which they actually separated from the Catholic Church. So if you go to high church, you'll have elements of the Catholic Church practices while the theology has been reformed. So they'll be thinking Protestant, so but they'll be pr- practicing Catholic. Yeah. 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 Well. Just as a preempting for next week, right? Just um, if the Ang- Ang- Anglican Church come from the Angles, as in the English? <laughs> yeah, it's like the Anglican yes. Church. The, it's yeah. England, yeah. Yes. So when There was a British Reformation as well. There was an English Reformation, which was um, to do with, yeah, the kings and basically whoever he wanted to marry. There was like the country became Catholic, then Protestant, then Catholic, then Protestant. Whoever he wanted to marry. So it's a different thing than that. But this was like the um, it was happening all over Europe around about the same time. The printing press was just about to be invented. So when Luther started to do Luther and others, they, they, they could get their works and send them out into the world so people could read about it and stuff like that. And um, Luther was scared into the Catholics, you know. But in England, it was like it was more of a political, ruling class reformation that occurred. It was like the state religion was changed. It was like it'd be like if um, um, what's it called our prime minister, name is Turnbull, was like, oh, we're going to be Muslim now. It's just a change of state religion. Yeah, but um, the, he just changed it because of his. Yeah, yeah. Th- these people weren't believers. They were people who um, it was just like convenient for him to marry a Catholic. So it's like, I now declare we are all Catholics, and it's like you know, and everyone's like, all right, it doesn't give me any more bread on my pa- you know table, and I don't get any more kind of benefit from this. It's just for him, you know. So, but then there was schisms, and there was heads butting together, and you got the Catholics separating from the Protestants, and they're both practicing in the same thing. They went to war over this. You know what I mean? In the in the post Reformation age, and they were fighting in the streets over this stuff. I mean, you know, and when you think about it, it's life and death. You know, we're talking about Jesus coming and you know, first of all, I'll remove your lampstand, then I'm going to fight with the sword, then I'll strike your children dead. England declared war on Scotland because Scotland refused to uh, join the Protestant Church, and they were like, "Oh, we're going to fight with the sword." Yeah. So they war on Scotland purely because they didn't want to be anti-Catholic. Yeah, but it's more of a, complete, a political standpoint. Yeah. Uh, King Henry was like, oh, well, I want to do what I want to do. So he did kind of what the Caesars did and was like, well, I'm going to create my own religion or create my own sect of this religion that my country is going to follow. And obviously Scotland were like, well... In, in the background to all this, the, the Catholic Church became the Holy Roman See, a political entity which influenced nations and it kind of... You know, it became ar- armies and wealth and all that kind of thing. And then, so it would be of an interest for a whole nation to side with the Pope mm. or not side with the Pope, depending on what's going on. Very complex. You can see overviews. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube on it which give good kind of five, ten minute kind of overview. But each kind of bit of it is a massive story in itself. It's like you, you, you just you could get a university degree just on that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so I wouldn't say do that. I'd just say. You know, there's worse things you can die Well, the Roman but Catholic See was, was a huge organisation. They didn't rule in any particular country for a thousand years. They were just on the earth with a great... They were a, a great political power for a thousand years. So some of it was in yeah, Russia. Still and still are. And it's still around. Yeah, it mm-hmm. still is around, sorry. But uh, uh, what was it? They ruled from uh, Russia, I think, uh, for one point. Well, they, they, were, they were everywhere. You know, everything was going on in, in Europe. Don't forget, America wasn't on the scene then, and Australia was, you know, just a lovely kind of place which should never have been tampered with. But, um, you know, these 
there's all these things going on in Europe and it was complex and political and it depended on what kings and popes and all that kind of thing. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Interesting characters in Britain though, there was one guy, and I can't remember his name now, but he was a believer, Cromwell, okay? Oliver Cromwell, and he, um, he just went in there and, and while Cromwell was on the throne for a short time, well, how he got to the throne was a bit weird because he was killing people. I don't know. But um, when he got to the throne, the country prospered for that time that he was on the throne. He was a believer, and it, it actually prospered, and it was just amazing. That. But um, so things have happened, backwards and forwards, and decisions made. Um, it's another hour till we can get into all that kind of stuff. And to be honest, I'm not brushed up in it as well as I should be. But um, it's complicated. But what we should know is that there was a re reformation starting in the 16th century which led to a pushback of the Roman Catholic Church. And um, Luke, Martin Luther was like, if you like, the poster boy. He wasn't a poster boy, but if he was like, he gets all the credit kind of thing. He went and spoke to the Pope. And, um, and when they left that meeting, his, his friends kidnapped him, right? <laughs> honestly. And they put him in a castle in Wittenberg in Germany. And that's when he sat and translated the New Testament from... Um, from from um, uh, Greek into German, so and that's where the Lutherans come from. Then we have a side with Luther, and next week we're going to talk about that. Not a lot about the Lutherans, but just generally the denominationalism and what that has spawned on the earth and the legacy of denominationalism and post-Reformation Church but concurrently existing at the same time as the Catholic Church as it does today. So. The Catholic Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got the Apocrypha, which is like extra books they call canonical, which means we've got 66 books that are canonical. They have another, is it extra 13 or something like that? Mm -hmm. And they've got the Apocrypha, and then, um, which really is the intertestamental period between Micah and Jesus, which has the Maccabees in it. All good reading, don't get me wrong, but it isn't the Word of God. And then you get the Pseudopigrapha, which is like the, the um, well, it says what it is, the Pseudo, but it's not actually anything to do with much and the Book of Enoch is just a collection of writings and that, and that's big on the internet at the moment. Stuff like that, though, it's, like, it's brought to question where like, the Enoch you know, was actually written, the time it was written. Hmm. Like, it, like it didn't, it's, it's fake, like, it's written. It is fake, yeah. Like, like hundreds of thousands of years late, well, not maybe thousands, but hundreds of years after hmm. uh, it says it's written. Yeah, it's, it's a fake. Enoch. So when it says the Book of Enoch in Jude, it's not that, what they're talking about. But all these, you know, like internet prophets are all, they're not prophets, they're kind of like YouTube prophets. They're all saying, oh, it's the Book of Enoch and it says this and all sorts of stuff's going on. So there's a, there's, a, there's a call for scriptural cleanliness. We've got to know what the scriptures are saying and nothing more, okay? And keep your head in the scriptures. So all this kind of stuff, you can watch it and be entertained by it and say, yeah, what if? But then don't buy into it because if it's, the scripture isn't saying it, no more, no less. And, the, and Paul told, told, told the Corinthians, "Don't go beyond what is written." Okay, so um, so that's that's another warning shot over and over. You decided that the, 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 at one point they decided our Bible, right? Mm. There was this group of people. What, what? Well, the, the, I mean, I want to I want to try and bring this to an end. We can probably start pick this up next week. We've got a bit more time. But um, basically, there was there was a criteria, a canon, uh, which, by which these were yeah. selected, and um, and that's something that I'll tell you about next week it's if a you huge want. Study, isn't it? Well, I mean, if, yeah, and and you know, we believe that God inspired. Is it the, if you, there's a evidence that demands a verdict, which is a book by Josh McDowell, and it's more like a doorstop, okay? And it's worth reading that because he goes into the academics behind it all and the whys and what fors. And um, I haven't read it all. I've dipped into it because to read it all would be like reading a telephone directory. You know what I mean? It's just like information. And some of it's not relevant for the just the common man, you know. Um, what we need to know today is Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible told me, tells me so. So, you know, that's that's the underlying thing, and that's my. I always say it, but my wife's, you know, I wish I had the kind of simplicity of faith of her. She she knows God loves her, and she loves God. Full stop. Don't get me wrong. She's she's academicish and all that, but some of this information I've told you tonight, you don't need. <laughs> No, no, no. You don't need a lot of this in information, what I've told you. It's interesting to hear it, and it feeds, and it's like, oh, yeah. this is outrageous how this has kind of been said before. Don't forget this was said before it all happened. <laughs> now it's happened and we're at the end of it. We go, oh, that's, that's kind of weird. That's kind of freaky. 
Jesus must be real. He must be speaking through the scriptures. And he can speak to you tonight if you ask him. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you um, have spoken and it has been written down. And we are looking at that, Lord, and we're amazed that through history there's been stuff that's gone down and it seems that you've preempted that. You've said that this will happen and then it happened. Uh, not just on a small scale or some backwater over there, but, Lord, it happened all over the world. So, Lord, God, we are standing out you and uh, we want to be the people who are not fighting with you. We're not being thrown into graves and stuff, Lord, but we want to be people who humbly come before you. Submission, yielding, um, abandonment of our own agenda our own um, we want you in the driving seat is basically what we say so help us all to be predisposed to that tonight in Jesus name Amen.